David Deutsch, in this splendid book, The Fabric of Reality, resorts to, and I think resort is the right word, the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory. Because the worst you can say of that is that it's preposterously wasteful. It postulates a vast and rapidly growing number of universes existing in parallel, mutually undetectable, except through the narrow porthole of quantum mechanical experiments. And these universes all differ in slight ways. In some of these universes, I'm already dead. In a minority of them, I have a green beard, and so on. The alternative Copenhagen interpretation is equally preposterous. The human mind was not evolved to understand these things, yet the predictions indicate that in some sense they are true. Science is humble enough to recognize that there are, that the universe is queerer than we can suppose. What is it that makes us capable of supposing anything? And does this tell us anything about what we can suppose? Are there things about the universe that will be forever beyond our grasp, but not beyond the grasp of some superior intelligence, some superior superhuman intelligence? Or are there things about the universe that are in principle ungraspable by any mind, however superior? The history of science has been a long series of violent brainstorms as successive generations have come to terms with increasing levels of queerness in the universe. We're now so used to the idea that the Earth spins rather than the sun moving across the sky, it's hard for us to realize what a shattering mental revolution that must have been. After all, it seems so obvious that the Earth is large and motionless, the sun small and mobile. Although it's worth recalling what Wittgenstein said on the subject. A friend asked Wittgenstein, sorry, Wittgenstein asked a friend of his, why do people always say it was natural for man to assume that the sun went round the Earth rather than that the Earth was rotating. His friend replied, well, obviously, because it looks as though the Sun is going round the Earth. Wittgenstein responded, well, what would it have looked like if it had looked as though the Earth was rotating? <laughs> Science has taught us many things against our intuition. Apparently solid things like crystals and rocks are really almost entirely empty space. The familiar illustration is uh, a fly in the middle of a, a sports stadium. The atom, the, 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 the nucleus of the atom is the fly in the middle of the sports stadium and the next nucleus is the next fly in the middle of the next sports stadium. The hardest, solidest, densest rock is, quote, really almost entirely empty space broken only by tiny particles so widely spaced they shouldn't count. Why then do rocks look and feel solid and hard and impenetrable? Well, as an evolutionary biologist, I'd say something like this. Our brains have evolved to help us survive within the orders of magnitude of size and speed at which our bodies normally operate. We never evolved to navigate in the world of atoms. If we had, our brains probably would perceive rocks as full of empty space. Rocks feel hard and impenetrable to our hands because our hands themselves can't penetrate them. It's therefore useful to our brains to construct notions like solidity and impenetrability. Moving to the other end of the scale, our ancestors never had to navigate through the cosmos at anything like the speed of light. If they had, our brains would be much better at, quote, quote, at coping with Einstein relativity. I give the name middle world to the medium scaled environment uh, with things moving at medium speeds in which we have evolved, in which our brains have evolved the ability to understand and take action. Steve Grand, he's the one on the left, Douglas Adams is on the right. In Steve, Ad uh, Steve Grand's book, Creation, Life and How to Make It, he is almost scathing with our mundane preoccupation with matter itself. We have this tendency to think that only solid material things really are things at all. Waves of electromagnetic fluctuation in a vacuum seem unreal, and to the Victorians they seem so unreal that they had to be waves in some material medium, so the Victorians invented the ether to cope with that. A whirlpool 
for Steve Grand is a thing with just as much reality as a rock, even though a whirlpool only has its shape because of motion. Uh, that, that's a similar effect. That's a, a sand dune in Tanzania which moves, which walks at about 17 meters per year, but it retains its shape because the wind blows the dust in that form. Another quotation from Steve Grand. He says, think of an experience from your childhood, something you remember clearly, something you can see, feel, maybe even smell, as if you were really there. After all, you really were there at the time, weren't you? How else would you remember it? But here is the bombshell. You weren't there. Not a single atom that is in your body today was there when that event took place. Matter flows from place to place and momentarily comes together to be you. Whatever you are, therefore, you are not the stuff of which you are made. If that doesn't make the hair stand up on the back of your neck, read it again until it does, because it is important. We are evolved denizens of middle world, and that limits what we are capable of imagining. We find it intuitively easy to grasp ideas like when a rabbit moves at the sort of medium velocity at which rabbits and other middle world objects do move and hits another solid middle world object, it knocks itself out. Science has the humility to recognize that there's an awful lot that we don't understand and maybe that we can't understand. Carl Sagan said, how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded this is better than we thought. The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead they say, no, 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 my God is a little God and I want him to stay that way. A religion, old or new, that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Faith, on the other hand, seems to me to show an arrogance which is missing from science. I know the truth and nothing will change my mind. My holy book tells me the truth and I need look no further. My priest, my pope, my ayatollah tells me the truth. I need look no further. An inner voice in my head tells me the truth. I need look no further, harking back to my quarterly review of biology spoof. So where science is filled with doubt, skepticism, willingness to learn, openness to correction, faith is exactly the opposite. I'm going to tell two anecdotes to illustrate the difference. Kurt Wise is an American geologist, highly qualified, trained at the University of Chicago and at Harvard in geology and paleontology under Steve Gould, no less. But he had a fatal weakness. He was infected with deep faith early in his life and he couldn't shake it off. And as he grew older, after he graduated, he became increasingly uneasy about the mismatch, the incompatibility between his science, his geology, his paleontology and his scripture. And one evening, he put it to the test with a pair of scissors. He got a Bible, and he went right through the whole Bible with, with a pair of scissors, cutting out, physically cutting out, every verse in the Bible that would have to go if he were to accept the scientific worldview that he'd learned at Chicago and Harvard. I quote, Try as I might, and even with the benefit of intact margins throughout the pages of Scripture, I found it impossible to pick up the Bible without it being rent in two. I had to make a decision between evolution and scripture. Either the scripture was true and evolution was wrong, or evolution was true and I must toss out the Bible. It was there that night that I accepted the word of God and rejected all that would ever counter it, including evolution. With that, in great sorrow, I tossed into the fire all my dreams and hopes in science. 